Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske Podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we are running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. Right now, we're up to episode two of season five. This one is called Darmok. It was directed by Weinrich Kolbe. Teleplay goes to Joe Minoski. The story credit goes to Joe Minoski and Philip Lezebnik. It aired back on September 30th, 1991. This is uh, considered one of the most popular TNG episodes of all time. It's season five kicking off a uh, a great run here. This is the one where the Enterprise encounters the children of Tama who speak in an incomprehensible manner and Picard is beamed down with the uh, Tama captain to a planet where he has to figure out what the hell is going on. Clay is here to talk about this one. Me and Clay are going to go deep on Darmok right after this. of Luwani, Luwani under two moons, Jiri of Umbaya, Umbaya of crossroads, and Lunga, Lunga her sky gray. Rai and Jiri at Lunga. Counselor. I sense nothing but good intentions from them, Captain. Mr. Data, the Tamarian seems to be stating the proper names of individuals and locations. Yes, but what does it all mean? I am at a loss, sir. Clay, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, what I consider to be one of the best uh, sort of creation pieces based off of Trek lore, Uh, but there is my favorite um, sort of fan service piece uh, mm. is a t-shirt that has a image of Picard wearing like a 70s rock outfit holding a guitar. <laughs> and it says, Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra with a tour date listing. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, I, think it's, I think it's my favorite sort of just, uh, it's like a perfect little joke about this. And hopefully, hopefully Picard is on the t-shirt wearing that sweet sweet crushed velvet and leather jacket he gets in this episode yeah this is the appearance of the suede jacket which is a a huge uh mistake (laughs) in my my opinion i don't know i would i would wear that i would wear that out on the town that whole getup he has with that sweet turtleneck he's got and everything yeah with like a a sort of gray blue undershirt uh that kind of gets i'm I'm surprised the exterior shot of the enterprise hadn't turned the enterprise into like a 1979 Fleetwood Cadillac or something. It's kind of, it's a combination of like a smoking jacket mixed with like a windbreaker because it has like a a sort of like stretchy bottom bit, which doesn't make much sense. Yeah, yeah. The other thing, I I forgot to mention this in Redemption, but... It's his class jacket. (laughs) I forgot to mention this in Redemption too. I wanted to bring it up. Um, Season five has one huge, huge, huge problem with it. Do you know what that is? Um, it has to do with the opening credits. An- anti-Semitism. Well, besides besides the uh, Nazi imagery that we are were present in this season, season five for some reason introduces when they show the Star Trek: The Next Generation title credits. It has like tracer lines behind it. Have you noticed oh, really? that? I haven't because I'll be honest with you, I skipped the credits. Oh, you skip? I, I watched because, the credits because <laughs> that's a long credit sequence. It is. It is. It's. It's. It gets my blood going though every single time. But watch it once. Let me know what you think. For some reason, they added these like motion tracer lines behind what was a very clean image before, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so now it looks like the words are you know shooting out of the sky at you. Oh, I see. Okay. And it looks like it is dated the show by 30 years. It, it looks so <laughs> terrible. It's awful. I can't believe they do it. I don't know how long they do it, but I, I really have to bring it up as mo- how much I hate that. But anyway, let's talk about Darmok. Uh, Wes in Boston recording a podcast. Clay at Somerville recording a podcast. Wes and Clay on Skype recording I a podcast. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> Let me say it 17 more I times. I don't understand. What do you think of... Uh, Am I, I have to kill you? <laughs> I'm, I'm holding up the Ethernet cords uh, in both hands. <laughs> what do you think of Darmok? 
Uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was um, kind of an interesting... At first, it, it, it seemed like an interesting uh, mirror to the original series episode where it's Kirk and that monster. The Gorn. Yeah, I think it's Arena. Or is that the name yeah, of the episode? Yeah, Arena, yeah. Yeah, where it's just the two of them on that planet and they got to fight each other. In slow motion. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of a nice mirror to that where it's like, yeah, this would be the Picard version of that where it, it's, it, it wouldn't just be, okay, I got to kill you. It would be him trying to, you know, talk things out and learn this guy's language. And yep. I, I really like this episode. I didn't so much care for the uh, Triceratops Predator monster. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. But that aside... Uh, I thought it was really good. I I really like this episode. I think it's really uh it's like borderline great. This is like a lesser great episode in my yeah. opinion. Um just because of Ashley Judd. Ashley Judd, you know, elevates any material from a 4 to a 5. Um and she she comes here and spouts some hardcore techno babble. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> in her scenes. But I I really love Darmok and I was thinking about it and I think one of the reasons I really really like this episode is We've talked before about how we've had problems, or I've had problems, especially in episodes that the best example would be like a romance episode, Mm -hmm. where they introduce a character, and they try to build this relationship between people, and there's not enough time in the episode to make you believe what's happening between them. I feel that this episode is similar to Sarek, and that even though Sarek featured a recurring character who'd been on the show before... It it gets to a like a really satisfying emotional place in a very short amount of time that feels natural. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I th- yeah I think you're right. They uh, they do a good job with this. Um, having those two guys together, it, there's a great episode of uh, 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 the Twilight Zone, uh, which actually stars Charles Bronson and uh, the woman who played Samantha on uh, Bewitched. Bewitched. Yeah. yeah, where they're two soldiers. They're like the two last soldiers in this this world war, and but they're from different countries, so they don't speak each other's language, and they have to figure out whether or not they should kill each other or coexist. And I think there is a third uh, antagonist thing that they have to kind of team up against, and it's very similar to this, but it, it works really, really well because you get, <clears throat> you know, you don't know anything about these characters before it starts, but you get to see them interact with each other, and you learn a lot about them and and how they. Uh, uh, how they relate to to people who are different from them. And it's really, it's kind of a, this episode of Star Trek is sort of like a, uh, it's really representative of, I think, what the c- core concept of the show is supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. You know, where it's like, oh, two, two groups who could just very easily go to war with each other, but have taken the time to figure things out and work together and everybody loves each other. And right, cetera, yeah, cetera. yeah. There's a bigger, bigger things at stake in a, in a weird sort of way than right. just sort of getting into a conflict with each other. It's um, I I I like the, I have some issues with this episode, but to to start off with the the things I really like, I like the, I think this is kind of there are problems with how they are portraying this language. I think yeah um, yeah there are, but I think that the. The main thing that it accomplishes is it, it works on a technical level because it gets around the universal translator mm-hmm. problem because you can understand the words they're saying, but not why they're saying those words. Right. Which is, I think, kind of a, a genius way to get around that problem. Um, and it also, it it's recognizable enough and they did a good enough job of the writing where you as the viewer can start to pick up on what the guy is actually saying. You yeah. know, by the end of the episode, yeah, like you know that Sokath is eyes uncovered as he realizes something. Um, when the walls fell, is a failure to do something. Um, and I think that it's it, they did a really good job of. It's not like Tolkien or anything, but they they've created a a very small culture that you can grow and understand by the end of the episode. Right, and they, uh, <clears throat> I think it's well done because they, um, they're. At at the in the first scene with these guys when they're on the uh, uh, on the screen and nobody can understand them. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, they're speaking fast enough and saying words that you're not comfortable hearing yet. Yep. So it does sound completely foreign, but they're actually using enough English words 
that you can start picking things out. And so the more you hear it, like you were saying, the more you become used to it. But having those English words in there helps you kind of add context to the words that they're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, instead of it just being completely alien. Right, yeah. Um, and it, it reminds me a little bit of... Uh, uh, the th- Do you ever see The 13th Warrior? Uh, remind me what that one is. Uh, it's Antonio Banderas is this uh, 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 Spanish guy, Spanish warrior, I think, who gets uh, who ends up going off with a, a band of Vikings, and it's a retelling <laughs> of uh, Beowulf. Oh no! But I anyway, I don't so. remember how, I don't remember the rest of the movie. But the part I always remember because it's the best thing in the movie is they're all sitting around this campfire. And they're all speaking this language that Antonio Banderas doesn't understand. Yeah. But the more he listens to them, the more it starts dropping in English words. Mm-hmm. Because you're you're watching the movie from his perspective, so English is his language in sure. the movie. You know what I mean? So as he's listening to these Vikings talk more and more, their language very slowly starts to turn into English. Yeah, that's kind of clever. So it's yeah, it's a great way to show that he's he's learning their language and can understand them now. I always thought that was a great a great way to show that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it's kind of similar to this. This actually might be a little bit better than that, um, because it's not completely dumping their their uh, language. It's actually making you understand what they're talking about. Right. Yeah, they're not technically changing anything. You're just as a viewer, you're becoming familiar with how things are how things work for these guys. Right. They're also. Um, they're, they have little nice touches, uh, about how, you know, the, the show to, uh, you could sort of criticize the show to this point in that every alien culture you meet is sort of human with like, you know, with some, some other sort of like ridge on their nose or something like that. Right. They, they tend to share very human things. These guys are humanoid, but they're like very different. And just the things of like, they wear those little knickknacks and he, he has that thing where he's sitting by the fire and he like drops the knickknack over and over again. Yeah. They, they sort of do very weird alien things that are never explained to you. Right. You don't know what the point of him doing all that stuff was, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a nice, it's a much more sort of believable way that you would think a lot of first contacts would go. <laughs> yeah. Between oh, the Federation. Yeah. Um, I did. <laughs> I did think it was kind of funny. At the end, though, when P- Picard does that touching his forehead motion. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah, obviously it's supposed to be touching that he's doing that thing. He doesn't know what that means. I, yeah, the right. guy does that once, and he does it after he, like, throws his shit on the ground. Like, he doesn't know what that thing means. It's, uh, th- it means this is the blade I've killed 5,000 people with or something, something like that. It's just carrying it on. I, I agree. I mean, to break down the – I have one uh, sort of major – I understand why they did it. I have one sort of major narrative problem with this one. Mm-hmm. I really, I understand why they had to do this to enforce to the audience about what was going on. I really hate the fact that Data and Troy figure out what is going on within two minutes of trying to figure it out. Yeah, of the inci- the indecipherable language. That Yeah, apparently, you know, Starfleet linguists have been unable to crack, and they crack it just by being like, hey, uh, is there any way where Darn- Darmok and Tanagra show up in the same place? And the computer's like, yes. Um, here's your example. <laughs> this is what this means. I understand they had to do it because they have to let the audience, they have to give the audience like a firm footing on what's going on. Right. I really feel Picard should have just figured it out on his own. He kind of does, yeah. but the, they, ham- they hammer it to the audience by having Data uh, explain what's going on. Yeah, I, um, I actually kind of wish that they had used Troy differently here because I think she could have actually been really useful and that because that first scene where they have uh her in the on on the bridge and they're like Troy what's going on she's like well I can't understand them but it doesn't sound like they're I mean I don't feel any animosity coming from them yeah I feel like she could be very helpful in that situation yes um yep you know and maybe they don't end up shooting at each other if she's somehow manages to uh uh um sort of suss out what's happening, like yeah, where, what their yeah. general intentions are, yeah. Also, yeah. I do love that <laughs> that even though Picard has kind of figured out everything, figured out the language, he does also uh, do the universal thing of talking to someone who doesn't speak your language, which is talking in your own language louder and slower. <laughs> and slower. Yeah. <laughs> He, he just just and sort of like using your hands much more just yeah. be like very 
Gilgamesh. Well, this- that's the, that was the thing. Okay, so that was the the problem I had with this with the narrative is they it takes way too long for them to try something other than talking. You know, because by the they because they get to the end and they're you know the guy's almost dying, and only at that point does is Picard like, oh well, maybe if I start drawing pictures and using right. symbols, yeah, you yeah. know, why didn't why hasn't anybody done that before? Huh. Or like the stuff that they're trying to convey, I feel like they could convey with gestures or hand motions or something that, that's a little bit easier than just being like, what I don't you what kill you? You want me to kill you? Yeah, yeah, I I think I agree. I think it's. I think it's kind of a problem of the how the because the aliens they have that conference room scene where they kind of describe like what the children of Tama, which is a great name, um, the children <laughs> of Tama, uh, how they think, and the the way they describe it makes it sound like they don't really think about things the same way. Like they describe it as they think of everything very abstractly, and they mm. have no sense of self. Yeah. Um. And I. The problem is that they're human enough where they interact with each... When you interact with them, you kind of are like, why can't you just, you know, draw me a picture or something mm-hmm. like that? Um, I think that's a that's kind of a limitation of the, the way that they've chosen to get this across. Because if they were too different, you know, there would be no... There's no possible interaction between them if they right, completely right. didn't understand what the other person was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I kind of agree with that. It's my, my main... My main issue with this language, which I think this is really just nitpicking because this I think the idea is stronger than um, the execution needs to be, or at least how, mm-hmm. how well thought out. Um, how does this race ever explain anything new to anybody? Well, see, okay, so I was thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, the first thing I thought about when they have that scene where they explain how the, the language works and... Uh, um, I think Crusher says it's Crusher or Troy says it's like if we were to say Juliet on the balcony. Yep. we would know what that means, but no one else would know, free of context. So I understand that, but by that definition of how it works, that on, that can only go back so far. Uh, like so, you can't be, being referential to something only works as far back as the reference exists. Right. So, like, at some point, someone would have to have written something down or told that story unless all of this just built off of things that – off of word-of-mouth things that people had actually seen. Right. So it's yeah. kind of – it's it's an interesting thing to think about how the genesis of it. Um, but, yeah. the or, um, or, like, how do you – like, I was thinking – it sort of ties into that. How do they educate – how do they teach their young – how to talk, yeah, you know, because right. if you don't understand the concept, how do you exactly? Yeah, yeah, Be- and yeah, and and they kind of they kind of do that a little bit at the end when they say Picard and what's his name at whatever. Yeah, um, it's like, oh, okay, well, that's how they create a new thing, right? Yeah, it's like, well, yeah. that doesn't make sense to anybody in this. That won't make sense to anybody outside of the people on this ship, right? Yeah, so they're yeah. gonna need to find a way to relate things they already talk about to a this new, new thing. <laughs> yeah. But if the new thing means something new or something else, how do you do that? Right. Is it like is it like Egyptian hieroglyphics where it's like, well it's not bird. It's bird plus hands <laughs> minus wolf or some <laughs> right. however that works. No, I uh, the, clearly right, the, I'm an Egyptian scholar. It, explaining something new almost takes more effort because you have to just you start with like a baseline and then you somehow modify it slightly. Yeah. Um which is again, it's it's sort of fascinating. I, I think that this concept is, it's a it's at times it is both like sort of brilliant and sort of like um, a little bit you know lacking kind of. I, I I hardly hold this against the show because I think they did a they chose a great idea or way to yeah uh, no to I, do I wouldn't this. I wouldn't t- I wouldn't say that any of that stuff is a negative. I think that's just it's just you know, ex- exploring what it actually would yeah mean, it's just you know? it's just a thought experiment. And um it's um it's nice to like we were saying before rewatching this one is interesting uh, especially for the scene before they beam down to the planet where the captain and his first officer on the other ship get into an argument with each other mm-hmm. you can actually track what they're saying uh eventually because they're using oh, all yeah, the language yeah. and it makes a lot more sense yeah. um which i just think is kind of a fascinating thing it's a um uh, it's a neat little neat little story device and i think that the 
the scene where I just like the plot mechanics. I, I, I love the fact that them trying to rescue Picard the first time through the transporter is what causes the other captain to die. Yeah, I I was I really liked that a lot, but the only thing I didn't like about it is that there was no acknowledgement of it on the other end. Like I feel like that's kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, there's no point... It, it had never that, happened before. They didn't have, know how to uh, explain yeah. what had gone well, on. Well, it's just like, you know, I feel like you could have tied that into the theme of the, the story if, you know, at, yeah. at that last scene where Riker comes in uh, and Picard's reading, you know, they he if he had said something about, like, you know, our, our uh, 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 hastiness to go to to assume the worst ended up causing this guy you know that kind of yeah, thing yeah 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 uh, something like that would have been interesting uh, not not a huge deal but yeah I, I i think i agree with that it's a um i just i like the the sort of mechanic of have it's two plot lines that working together make sense it's the a and b plot line working it's not really b plot line but it's kind of is um they this one we had an episode before uh, where i complained about the b plot line kind of just exists to give the cast something to do yeah. Um and it's kind of distracting a little bit sometimes. I will say that I really loved uh Frakes as Riker in command of a situation that he's sort of unsure about what's going on. And yeah, yeah. He's kind of a dick. Yeah. Yeah, he he um <laughs> well, I think it was I really liked it cuz it was a good uh a good comparison of the two commanders uh in Riker and Picard. Mhm. Uh, because Picard, uh, you know, while Picard is facing a seemingly certain death at the hands of some battle he doesn't know that he's in, um, he still takes the time to try and figure things out and 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 find the more peaceful solution. Right. Yep. Where Riker is just like these guys stole our captain. Figure out how to blow these guys up. Right. Or, yeah. Like he's he's all about. He's all about getting. I mean, which is, I mean, rightly so. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> no, he's he's making a decision that makes sense in both terms of narrative and what the character would sort of call for. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's unclear to them what's going on. He needs to get a little bit more aggressive to try to fix the situation. Uh, yeah, he's R- getting- Riker. Riker doesn't understand what's happening on the planet. The only people who understand that are Picard and the other guy. Yep. And he can't. There's no way for him to understand it because he can't talk to the other people the other ship right the yeah. only thing he knows is that they're really good shots <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that's true yeah the uh the children of tama are an interesting um level of technology where they're basically just slightly they're, they're either equal to the enterprise or slightly ahead of it in some mm-hmm. ways which is fascinating i do i do have to point out once again i know that it's a product of the fact that this show was on a like 13 inch screen for everybody to watch, but there's no reason those ships should be so close. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's a nice composition where they have that giant ship kind of like sticking out of the top of the frame and then they've got the enterprise there, but it's like, they're like, you could throw a rock and hit the enterprise from that ship. Yeah. It's, it's a, technically a strong space wind will blow you right, right into them or something technically you could throw a rock and hit any ship because that rock would never stop moving yeah eventually it'll hit something right? science that's that is that is deep deep science the episode uh didn't go into that unfortunately which is a damn shame but we ended uh redemption 2 uh by talking about uh it really just ends with Worf just sort of stepping back into his old role with no no questions asked yeah um he does it effectively here because everything he brings up is shot down by somebody at some point in this episode, <laughs> which is back to the old wharf that we know and love. Um, Children of Tama, uh, did you have any? I feel like I, I don't. I don't want to give short shrift to how I think this is a really well uh, constructed episode. I, I think it builds nicely on things. I think it it uh, re- the way that they relate it to the Gilgamesh story is Mm -hmm. really nice Uh, i like that sort of um you know the way that they communicate is built on their previous myths and we're going to picard is going to relate it to our previous myths you know we're all the same that kind of garbage but it's really done very nicely and i like that scene between uh picard and the other captain where he's telling that story um yeah i really like that scene but it i think and i think it works inside the episode, but I do, it is one of those things where I was thinking about it. It's like, well, 
I know what he's trying to do, but what he's doing wouldn't make any sense to the guy he's talking to. I think it didn't. I think it doesn't matter. I think Picard. I, I don't. I don't think it matters either. I yeah. think it, it works. It works fine. But you know, it would just be. <laughs> it would be like if I were like Wes. I finally understand your language. So let me tell you something you'll understand. Blah 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 blah. Right. Blah 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 blah. Darmok. Blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> Arms wide open. Blah 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 blah. I, I agree. I think I think what the story is kind of saying is that it, it's baby steps at this point, and they're yeah, they've made yeah. a step just in that they're willing to talk sort of to each other and at least pretend to know what the other one is talking about. Right. Right. Um, so I appreciate it for that, and I, I I think it's it's a it's tough just because I'm I'm not super familiar with the Gilgamesh story, unfortunately. So I, it's not as hard hitting as like a, like a relating to like the a Zeus or something. What I would know, but I I think the show, from what it explains, does a pretty good job of relating these two things together. Yeah, I was kind of surprised they went that far back. Yeah, um, I thought they would use something that was a little bit more. I don't want to say contemporary, but something that was a little bit more widely known. Tom Sawyer, uh, Huckleberry Finn. This is yeah. exactly, it's exactly a Huck and Tom on the river, or what a Huck and Jim on the river. <laughs> um, interesting, interesting. Well, I think we we've t- talked about this one for a pretty good bit. I uh, I enjoy this one very much. Me and Clay are going to take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. It's probably going to involve aliens uh, saying quotes, so be ready for that. We'll be back in a couple seconds with our final thoughts. Cinder. His face black, his eyes red. Tamak. The river Tamak. In winter. Tamak. And Jalad. At Tanagra. Tamak. And Jalad. On the ocean. So Karth, his eyes open. The beast of Tanagra. Uzani, his army. Shaka, when the walls fell. Picard and Dathan at Eladril. with sails unfurled. Timber, his arms open. Timber, at rest. Thank you. All right, Clay, let's slip on our sweet suede jackets and uh, (laughs) give final ratings for uh, Darmok, which is the second episode of season five. Um, you go first this time. Well, I can't. I can't decide whether or not "Darmok on the Ocean" sounds like metal lyrics or if it sounds like uh, Cat Stevens lyrics. Yeah, it's uh, Dar- "Darmok on the Ocean." It sounds very video gamey too, or something. There's something very. <laughs> I, I imagine like Wind Waker, the Zelda game, for some reason, where it's just mm-hmm. him sailing around on a boat. Um, it's also a. I think, all your all your Darmok are are as wide open. Well, I mean the the other thing you can do is. I think one of the when they when Troy is asking the computer for Darmok definitions, mm-hmm. one of them is like a dessert. Yeah. So you could the album could just be the dessert in a boat on the ocean and uh, just get some multi you know get all the cultures involved. Yeah. Someone who's listening to this write a song using those those that story. So Kath, his eyes uncovered. What do you think of this one? Uh, I'm gonna give this one a four. I like this one a lot. Um, I think they. So far, they're coming out swinging in season five. Um, these feel like they are. This one and the last one both feel like they are a, above average for what they've been doing the past five years. Yeah. Um, yep. And I mean, if 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 we get to the point halfway through this season or whatever where I start giving ones that are like this a three, I'm going to consider that a success because that means that. These good episodes are now the average episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, which would be interesting to see. I don't know how season five plays out, but yeah, season five is good. Just going by episode titles, there's going to be a couple clunkers in there. Obviously, there always are. But I mean, uh, here's a question for you: 
do you think this episode would be any better or worse off if the uh, what are they called? The brothers of Chil- Tarn, Ch- children of Tama. Children of Tama. Okay. They all play if- drums. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, uh, do you think it would be better, any better, or, uh, sorry, do you think it would be any better or worse off if they were more uh, intimidating in their appearance? Um, it, would pr- it would probably help. Yeah, because I feel like they're kind of like, they're borderline goofy looking. And, it, and they're like, they're very unthreatening looking. Yes, and even when they're yelling, they're not super threatening. Um, yeah. Or like... I kind of agree. Like I appreciate what they were doing, where the you know the it's well designed in that when the guy appears to Picard, he's holding up two knives. You know, yeah. in his mind, he's making a very clear statement of here, fight with me. But in Picard's mind, he wants to fight him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do kind of. I think they could have been a little bit more either their voice or something. I don't know if that would have been a mistake, just to have them more of like a growly sort of voice, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, something more intimidating. But I think that they. It also doesn't help that he's a little bit. He's a little bit of like a portly guy yeah. who's like wearing a jumpsuit. Um, I, what do you think? Would you have? Would you do have uh, gone that way? Made them more aggressive? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know because I feel like doing that is is more. Uh, a more cliched way to do it. Yeah. Um, because it's it's pretty it's screaming pretty clearly that there's. A misunderstanding of culture or whatever because well, I'm thinking like if they had if they had used someone that looks like a Klingon would it have still worked and I think it would still work but I think it would be a little bit more I think you'd see it coming a lot more yeah I think the the one the one um, kind of difference would be at least in, in terms of the story is that Starfleet has encountered these guys before right. you know and they, they've said like everything went fine we just had no idea what they were talking about <laughs> <laughs> um, so if they're intimidating looking, it, it almost seems like they would be more on guard, which might interfere with the sort of the way that this story wants to go, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. But I, I, I don't mind them. I think their design is, is um, competent. I, it, it would be interesting to see if any changes in that regard would uh, amount to anything. So you're going to give this guy a four? I am, yeah. I'm going to give it a five. I think it's a, I think it's a, str- uh, I think it's a strong contender for like a top, where would I slate this? It, it might be a top 10 by the time this is all said and done. Um, it's a very quiet five, sort of, which I kind of appreciate. We had, um, I had posed the question to you before about whether or not, sometimes I feel like the five episodes in Star Trek are like the sort of epic, something huge has happened episodes. Yeah, yeah. And this is an example, I think, of it's a small scale, but it's really good, uh, which is nice to see. Mm. Um, it's not like yesterday's Enterprise where you're going back in time to write history or best of both worlds where Picard is assimilated. Until the next episode where they go back in time to save that captain. They go back in time to rewrite the Darmok story. They go back and meet Darmok and uh, change everything that happened. And wait till you see what happens when the invisible Triceratops monster teams up with the Borg. What, what didn't you like about the... I, I hate the Triceratops monster. What didn't you like about it? I think... <laughs> I think it brings a really good science fiction episode and drops it squarely in Galaxy Quest territory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really goofy. Like, and I understand why they did it, sort of. You, I, you know, I was thinking about it. You know what I would have done? What's that? I would have had Monster Cam, and you never see the monster. Okay, yeah. That could have worked. Yeah, I think... It's, or, yeah, or made it even less... If they had made it less clearly just a guy in a suit, yeah, if it had right. been like non humanoid or something, that probably would have worked too. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it. I mean, I, I understand that it's there because it, the episode has to have some sort of action to it, but it's just so, it just, it just doesn't work. Like, it, there's, in the, in the Star Trek reboot movie, the first one, uh, I don't know if this is just something that J.J. Abrams loves to do because he does it in the new Star Wars too. But there's a certain point where, out of nowhere, Kirk has to run from a giant monster. Yeah, and it just seems so. And they, it's the same thing happens in Star Wars, um, uh, where Captain Kirk has to run from a giant monster. <laughs> and it it's, just it's feels not, it's not the prime universe of Star Wars. It's the uh, the other one. <laughs> Sorry, did I did I ruin it? Did I ruin Force Awakens for anyone who hadn't seen it? Uh, 
but yeah, it just comes out of nowhere, and it seems like it doesn't fit the tone of the rest of the movie. Right, uh, yeah. The rest of the story. And I feel the same way here. I think, like, if they had done something that wasn't as clearly just, you know, uh, we've got 20 minutes to build a monster suit kind of thing. Right, yeah. Uh, I, it would be, <laughs> I'd be curious to, to know whether or not it was always um, meant to be camouflaged like that, like see-through. Was there a point where they built the suit and they were like, oh, shit, this is not going to work? Yeah, that's, that's true. Because the invisibility doesn't really serve much of a purpose besides it's just, like, you can't. You can't easily find. There's no reason why, if the monster was not able to go invisible, it would be any less of a threat to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also for the the children of Tama, the captain. He seems to know what's down there, right? Like he plans this whole thing. Yeah, that was the other thing that it wasn't entirely clear about whether or not he, like, what this planet is, or or if he's familiar with it, or you know, et yeah, cetera, et cetera. If he is familiar with it, he went down. Uh, seemingly ill-equipped to deal with this because the knives seem to do nothing to this oh, creature. Yeah, no. like, you just Picard. Well, gets... he was planning on having two of them, yeah, and not true. having Picard get you know janked out of there by <laughs> Miles O'Brien halfway through the fight. Well, before that, uh, Picard's uh, blue suede shirt is ripped and exposing his bare chest, which is a, a nice touch that they had to go through. Oh my goodness! Well, something for the ladies. Yeah, you got to get those female viewers anyway. Guys, I'm going to give this a one of five. I think it's a uh, strong episode. I really enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun. It's, it's. It, I find it very similar to Sarek. I get a, a similar sort of very satisfied response to it. Um, it covers. It runs a great gamut. You feel kind of bad for the captain at the end, um, you, as you felt bad for Sarek in the Sarek episode. Um, I think it's. I think it's really, really effective. So, thank you guys for listening. If you're on YouTube, a like and a comments appreciated. If you're on iTunes, a rating and review is very, very helpful. Clay, thanks for coming on. Anytime. We uh, we just also heard news. We'll just talk for a second. Uh, Brian Fuller is going to be the showrunner for the new Trek series. So, Clay, do you have any, any thoughts at all about that, a sentence or two? Uh, yeah, I think, I think, as I said on Twitter, I think it'll be good until um, the Enterprise has multiple serial killers fighting each other uh, running around on the ship. And the, the bridge is very, very dark with a lot of sweaty people. Yeah. Uh, thinking, <laughs> thinking about things. No, he 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 does he does good stuff. He uh, you know I, I I was not aware that he actually wrote for Star Trek in the past, so that seems like he's a good fit. Yeah, it seems like it's the best of both worlds. So you you get someone who created a critically acclaimed show, right? So he yeah. he's 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 aware of how to create modern TV, and he actually well, he's done he's done a couple, hasn't he? He's done. Did he do Six Feet Under or one of those shows? Did he write on it? Or uh, Hannibal's the only I one remember. I know that he actually is like showrunner for. Oh, it is okay. Um, but outside of that, it's he's also, as you said, he worked on DS Nine and Voyager, which is like you have feet in both worlds, which I think yeah. it was huge for the new per- the next person to have. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm excited to uh, I'm excited to see that it's on CBS All Access, which is bizarre, but we'll, that's the world we live in. Um, I can't wait to not pay for it somewhere yes that'll be very it'll be, I, I look forward to uh borrowing sean's password to watch this yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you mr and mrs cordy um anyway thank you guys for listening and i'll be back in a couple days with i think ensign rose after this yeah it is so see you guys